Chapter 7 The Opening of the Third Eye My birthday came, and during that day I was at liberty, free from lessons, free from services. The Lama Mignard donned up said, in the early morning, Have an amusing day, Lab Sang, we are coming to see you at dusk. It was very pleasant lying on my back, blazing in the sunlight. Slightly below me I could see the Patala with its roofs agleam. Behind me, the blue waters of the Nobu Linga, or Jewel Park, made me wish that I could take a skin boat and drift along. South I could watch a group of traders, crossing the Kaichu Ferry. The day passed too quickly. With the death of the day, the evening was born, and I went to the little room where I was to stay. There came the murmur of soft felt boots on the stone floor outside, and into the room came three lamas of high degree. They put an herbal compress to my head and bound it tightly in place. In the evening the three came again, and one was the lama Mignardonda. Carefully the compress was removed, and my forehead wiped clean and dry. A strong-looking lama sat behind me and took my head between his knees. The second lama opened a box and removed an instrument made of shining steel. It resembled a brad owl, except that instead of having a round shaft, this one was U-shaped, and in place of a point there were little teeth around the edge of the U. For some moments the lama looked at the instrument, and then passed it through the flame of a lamp to sterilize it. The lama Mignardondup took my hands and said, this is quite painful, love sang, and it can only be done while you are fully conscious. It will not take very long, so try to keep as still as you can. I could see various instruments laid out and a collection of herbal lotions, and I thought to myself, Well, love sang, my boy, they will finish you one way or the other, and there is nothing you can do about it except keep quiet. The lama with the instrument looked round to the others and said, All ready? Let us start now. The sun has just set. He pressed the instrument to the center of my forehead and rotated the handle. For a moment there was a sensation as if someone was pricking me with thorns. To me it seemed that time stood still. There was no particular pain as it penetrated the skin and flesh, but there was a little jolt as the end hit the bone. He applied more pressure, rocking the instrument slightly so that the little teeth would fret through the frontal bone. The pain was not sharp at all, just a pressure and a dull ache. I did not move with the Lama Mignard donned up looking on. I would rather have died than make a move or outcry. He had faith in me, as I in him, and I knew that what he did or said was right. He was watching most closely, with a little pucker of muscles in tension at the corners of his mouth. Suddenly there was a little scrunch, and the instrument penetrated the bone. Instantly its motion was arrested by the very alert operator. He held the handle of the instrument firmly while the Lama Mignot Dondup passed him a very hard, very clean sliver of wood, which had been treated by fire and herbs to make it as hard as steel. The sliver was inserted into the U of the instrument and slid down, so that it just entered the hole in my head. The Lama operating moved slightly to one side so that the Lama Mignardondap could also stand in front of me. Then, at a nod from the ladder, the operator, with infinite caution, slid the sliver farther and farther. Suddenly I felt a stinging, tickling sensation apparently in the bridge of my nose. It subsided and I became aware of subtle scents which I could not identify. That too passed away and was replaced by a feeling as if I was pushing or being pushed against a resilient veil. Suddenly there was a blinding flash, and at that instant the Lama Mignardondup said stop. For a moment the pain was intense, like a searing white flame. It diminished and died and was replaced by spirals of colors and globules of incandescent smoke. The metal instrument was carefully removed, 
the sliver of wood remained. It would stay in place for two or three weeks, and until it was removed I would have to stay in this little room almost in darkness. No one would see me except these three lamas, who would continue my instruction day by day. Until the sliver was removed, I would have only the barest necessities to eat and drink. As the projecting sliver was being bound in place so that it could not move, the Lama Mingyat Tondup turned to me and said, You are now one of us, Lab sang. For the rest of your life you will see people as they are and not as they pretend to be. It was a very strange experience to see these men apparently enveloped in golden flame. Not until later did I realize that their auras were golden because of the pure life they led and that most people would look very different indeed. As my new-found sense developed under the skillful ministrations of the lamas, I was able to observe that there were other emanations extending beyond the innermost aura. In time I was able to determine the state of a person's health by the color and intensity of the aura. I was also able to know when they were speaking the truth or otherwise by the way the colors fluctuated. But it was not only the human body which was the subject of my clairvoyance. I was given a crystal, which I still have, and in its use I had much practice. There is nothing at all magical in crystals. They are merely instruments, just as a microscope or telescope can bring normally invisible objects into view by using natural laws, so can a gazing crystal. It merely serves as a focus for the third eye, with which one can penetrate any person's subconscious and retain the memory of facts gleaned. The crystal must be suited to the individual user. Some persons work best with a rock crystal. Others prefer a ball of glass. Yet others use a bowl of water or a pure black disc. No matter what they use, the principles involved are the same. For the first week the room was kept in almost complete darkness. The following week just a glimmer of light was admitted, the amount increasing as the end of the week drew close. On the seventeenth day the room was full of light, and the three lamas came together to remove the sliver. It was very simple. The night before my forehead had been painted with an herbal lotion. In the morning the lamas came, and as before, one took my head between his knees. The operator took hold of the projecting end of the wood with an instrument. There was a sudden sharp jerk, and that is all there was to it. The sliver was out. The Lama Minyardonda put a pad of herbs over the very small spot left and showed me the sliver of wood. It had turned as black as ebony while in my head. The operator Lama turned to a little brazier and placed the wood upon it with some incense of various kinds. As the combined smoke wafted to the ceiling, so was the first stage of my initiation completed. That night I fell asleep with my head in a whirl. What would Zhu look like now that I saw differently? Father? Mother? How would they appear? But there was no answer to such questions yet. In the morning the lamas came again and examined me carefully. They said that I could now go out with the others, but told me that half my time would be spent with the lama Mingyardondap, who would teach me by intensive methods. The other half of my time would be spent attending classes and services, not so much for the educational side, but to give me a balanced outlook by mixing. A little later I would be taught by hypnotic methods as well. For the moment I was mainly interested in food. For the past eighteen days I had been kept on a very small allowance. Now I intended to make up for it. Out of the door I hurried, intent only on one thought. Approaching me was a figure smothered in blue smoke, shot through with flecks of angry red. I uttered a squeak of alarm and dashed back into the room. The others looked up at my horrified expression. There's a man on fire in the corridor, I said. The Lama Mignard Dondup hurried out and came back smiling. Lam sank that is a cleaner in a temper. His aura is smoky blue, as he is not evolved, 
and the flux of red are the temper impulses showing. Now you can again go in search of that food you want so much. It was fascinating meeting the boys I knew so well, yet had not known at all. Now I could look at them and get the impression of their true thoughts, the genuine liking for me, the jealousy from some, and the indifference from others. It was not just a matter of seeing colors and knowing all. I had to be trained to understand what those colors meant. My guide and I sat in a secluded alcove where we could watch those who entered the main gates. The Lama Minyardonda would say, The one coming, Glavse, do you see that thread of color vibrating above his heart? That shade and vibration indicates that he has a pulmonary disease, or perhaps at an approaching traitor. Look at this one. Look at those shifting bands, those intermittent flecks. Our brother of business is thinking that he may be able to delude the stupid monks, Lab sang. He is remembering that he did so once before. To what penny meanness will men stoop for money? As an aged monk approached, the Lama said, Watch this one very carefully, Lab sang. Here is a truly holy man, but one who believes in the literal word for word accuracy of our scriptures. You observe those discolorations in the yellow of the nimbus? It indicates that he has not yet evolved far enough to reason for himself. So it went on, day after day, particularly with the sick we used the power of the third eye, for those who were sick in the flesh or sick in the spirit. One evening the Lama said, Later we shall show you how to shut the third eye at will for you will not want to watch people's failings all the time. It would be an intolerable burden. For the moment, use it all the time, as you do your physical eyes. Then we will train you to shut it and open it at will as you can the other eyes. Many years ago, according to our legends, all men and women could use the third eye. In those days the gods walked upon the earth and mixed with men. Mankind had visions of replacing the gods and tried to kill them, forgetting that what man could see the gods could see better. As a punishment, the third eye of man was closed. Throughout the ages, a few people have been born with the ability to see clairvoyantly. Those who have it naturally can have its power increased a thousandfold by appropriate treatment, as I had. As a special talent, it had to be treated with care and respect. The Lord Abbot sent for me one day and said, My son, you now have this ability, an ability denied to most. Use it only for good, never for self-gain. As you wander in other countries, you will meet those who would have you behave as a conjurer in a fair. Prove us this, prove us that, they will say. But I say, my son, that this must not be. The talent is to enable you to help others, not to enrich self. Whatever you see by clairvoyance, and you will see much, do not disclose it if it will harm others or affect their path through life. For man must choose his own path, my son. Tell him what you will, he will still go his own way. Help in sickness and suffering, yes, but do not say that which may alter a man's path. The Lord Abbot was a very learned man, and was the physician who attended the Dalai Lama. Before concluding that interview, he told me that within a few days I was going to be sent for by the Dalai Lama who wanted to see me. I was going to be a visitor at the Patala for a few weeks, with the Lama Minyardonda.